Good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Dietz, Director and Associate Dean for Stanford Continuing Studies. Thank you for joining us today for Discover Stanford for You. We're excited to bring you this event. It's being co-sponsored by Continuing Studies and the Office of External Relations. I'd now like to introduce Arun Majumdar, the Dean of Stanford Door School of Sustainability. He is the J. Precourt Professor, Professor of Mechanical Engineering, of Energy Science and Engineering, and of Photon Science. He is also a Senior Fellow by courtesy at the Hoover Institution. Welcome. Thank you, Jennifer. Can you hear me? Excellent. Well, first of all, um, welcome to all of you. I'm super excited uh, to be here, and, and we are all uh, very excited to launch the new school, the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. It is the first school Stanford is launching in 70 plus years, and it's a very big deal. And it's really designed to address through our research, education, our engagement with the outside world, arguably the defining challenge of the 21st century, which is how do we create how do we create a, an environment where humanity and our planet can thrive together? We are coming into the 21st century with many unintended consequences of the 20th century, and we can't let that happen again. So how we approach this, both from a technology point of view, from a policy, from social sciences, is critically important. Just to give you a few, this very brief introduction about the school. The school is a different kind of school than what we've had in the past. It's a, it, uh, the best way to describe it is a three-legged stool. One leg is what I call the superpowers of a traditional school, which is where we have departments, we have recruiting faculty, a lot of talent, and we have, we admit students, we offer degrees, we develop curricula. That's a superpower of a school, and we have that. We just launched the Department of Oceans. We have a social sciences division with potentially two departments coming out of that because we feel the integration of social sciences with the physical sciences and, and, and humanities is critically important to address this issue. The second leg of the stool are institutes. These are the Woods Institute for the Environment, the Precourt Institute for Energy, and we're gonna launch a third institute for sustainable societies. And these institutes bring together faculty, students from across the campus. They've been doing it for the last 15 or 20 years. And they, they use that interdisciplinary intellectual horsepower to translate the knowledge into proof of concept breakthroughs and solutions. That's what institutes have done. And they have done very well. And the third institute is a new one on sustainable societies. That's the second leg. We felt that the departments and the institutes are absolutely necessary to give enough permeability for the campus to come together and address this challenge. But we also felt it was not sufficient. So there's a third leg of this school, which is the sustainability accelerator, which is really a launch pad to leverage the Stanford knowledge and launch solutions, technology solutions, policy solutions, platforms that can bring the world together that are scalable. So think of the institutes as proof of concept of ideas and the accelerator is proof of scalability before we launch the solutions to the world, which will invariably require us to partner with outside organization for us to listen to the outside world, to understand what the real challenges are around the world and co-develop solutions and help and implement them with our partners. And through this process, we learn a lot more of what's going around the world and bring that back to a research and educational system process that we have out here and help educate our students and our faculty 
about what the real situations are. The feedback loop is very critical. We have a group of faculty out here who are right in the middle of this. And it is really my pleasure. And these are really the top faculty in our school. There are many more, but you'll get a sample. And it's really a pleasure for me to introduce the next speaker, Michael Wara, who's playing a very important role in our policy environment out here, especially in our accelerator. Michael? Thanks very much, Arun. I'm Mike Wara. I am the Interim Director of Policy for the Sustainability Accelerator, as well as a Senior Research Scholar at the Woods Institute for the Environment. I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, and sort of in, and provide some greater specificity about what the accelerator is and is doing already and its role in the new school. And I'll just launch off from what Arun said and, and, and just agree, say that what we're doing within the Sustainability Accelerator at Stanford is really about impact and helping Stanford faculty, re researchers and grad students to find a path to creating impact in the world using their research and helping them to scale that impact more quickly than otherwise might be the case. The school, the school, of course, crosses many disciplines. You know, we're we're really incorporating a, a huge number of departments and and really ways of thinking about the sustainability challenge um, into a big umbrella, and the accelerator reflects that as well. Where you know you may have heard or be familiar with, uh, or have perhaps even participated in the many tech accelerators that exist in the Bay Area. Um, our accelerator, you know, really casts a wider net in the sense that we are working on hard technology solutions for the sustainability challenge, but we are also working with social scientists and people in the humanities and people, uh, boundary professionals uh, like myself that engage deeply with communities and policymakers to craft policy solutions that will be important also to achieving um, our broader sustainability goals as a society in the Bay Area, in California, the United States, and really at a planetary scale. Um, the work is different than um, you know, typical um, academic practice, which is quite focused on uh, teaching and basic research generally, but builds on a long expertise and, and, and practice at Stanford of moving ideas from the laboratory out into the world. Um, you know, we're a university that has long been known for producing great entrepreneurs and, and companies um, whose basic ideas are derived from research at Stanford, really dating back to Terman and, and the beginning of the um, semiconductor industry. The goal of the, of the accelerator is really to support teams um, within Stanford that are interested in doing this kind of impact focused work. We awarded um, our first 30 grants uh, in May of this year, and they span a wide variety of projects from very hard energy, early energy technology focused projects to environmental justice to global fisheries and the challenge of a sustainable um, food, uh, foods from the ocean. And, and that's really part of the idea is to, is to fund and support and uplift and the work of, of scholars from a broad swath of the university to really bring people into the practice of, of impact focused work. We have a strong belief that the way to, or, or I, I should say, we have a we have a hypothesis. I, I do believe in this from my practice that that the the way to create impact is really to build strong external partnerships in technology. That means getting to know your customer, you know, getting to know the application of a new technology really well, so that you can understand the use case and product market fit. In the policy space, it means deeply engaging with stakeholders, whether those stakeholders are community activists in the Central Valley or in Richmond or policymakers at the global level. We are pushing and supporting our faculty at the same time. This is a mix of carrots and a little bit of maybe not a stick, but a nudge, a strong nudge to, 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 to engage early and often with external partners so that the work they're doing is really in some sense co-created, right? That 
the 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 techno on the technology side that the research is happening in the first instance with with deep insight into the needs and the challenges of the energy transition and on the policy side that it's happening with a lot of nuance as to the real problems and the real challenges that policymakers face as they seek to implement um, more sustainable uh, law and regulation. You know, for me, this, this work is familiar. I've been involved, um, actively involved um, for a number of years in work with the state of California on wildfire policy and the, the interaction between wildfire policy and utilities. And I'm sure any, any of the people from California on this call um, are familiar with what I am talking about. Um, we've had many challenges there and, and our work really, really begins with um, connecting with key stakeholders in the forest uh, management and science space, also the utility space, and crafting analysis and, and, and support to develop solutions to these problems. And that's, that's you know, one model in the policy space of what we hope to achieve. But I think another aspect of what we're doing is we really are trying to support multiple models of what this external partnership looks like and trying to help um, all of these different ideas about how to create impact move faster so that they can achieve impact sooner and hopefully achieve a, a greater impact in, in our world. And I think the university has, has, a, has a tremendous opportunity given the depth of talent and human capital that exists at Stanford and a real responsibility to be a leader in this space. And that's what the accelerator is all about. And I'm just thrilled to play a role in its beginnings and development as an idea within Stanford. Uh, so the plan for the rest of the program um, is to have two of our teams, two of our first 30 grantees talk to you about what they're doing. And you're gonna see that um, the, the, the enormous breadth in the work that's happening within the accelerator. Um, first, we're gonna have uh, Professor uh, Jennifer Cochran and Nikita Klistov share research that they're doing um, focused on developing biorecycling of plastics. And, and this is an enormous challenge um, and they are doing incredibly innovative work uh, and that the accelerator is, I'll just say personally, I'm very proud to be supporting. N after that, Jenny Sakali is gonna share her work on mitigating climate risk for vulnerable populations in, the, uh, in California's Central Valley. This is a place where there are real gaps in um, our approach to protecting people from, you know, the increasingly uh, frequent extreme events that we're experiencing due to climate change. And Jenny is building a new program to, to, to really focus Stanford energy and efforts on this problem. And again, we're incredibly proud that the accelerator could support the work. Um, this will be followed by a fireside chat. I guess, do you still call it that on Zoom? I guess we do. Um, a, a conversation between the the four of us, and then Q and A, and I'd encourage you to to put questions for the, into the chat for the Q and A, um, and then we'll close with a reflection uh, from one of Stanford's partners and neighbors, Georgia Farouk, who's the executive driver, director of Thrive Alliance. Um, so now I'm going to turn the program over to 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 Jennifer and Nikita, and um, thank you very much um, for tuning in and taking the time to learn about the accelerator. Thank you, Michael. It's such a pleasure to be here today with you all. I'm Professor Jennifer Cochran. I am a professor in the Department of Bioengineering and also the chair of the department. And I'd also like to introduce my colleague, Nikita Filspoff, who is going to be telling you a little bit about our exciting work to uh, recycle plastic, particularly related to textiles. So I just want to take a moment to introduce our team. We have a very impressive interdisciplinary team. One of the things I love about Stanford is in our DNA is uh, the ability to be very cross-disciplinary. So department boundaries are very blurred. And I think that's really what's needed for us to be able to solve some of these grand challenges in sustainability. So I've already introduced Akita and you'll hear more from him in a moment. We have uh, Matteo Cardinello, who's a professor in chemical engineering. Craig Criddle, who's a professor in civil and environmental engineering. And then we have some additional team members, McKenna, Marissa, and Genesis, who really round out the research group here. And on the right, you can see a number of different areas that we focus on, synthetic biology, protein engineering, bioremediation, polymer science, 
type of its screening, and Nikita will explain a little bit more about what that is in a few minutes, nanocatalysis, sustainability, and biomanufacturing. So I wanted to just start off this presentation by telling you a little bit about myself. So for the past two decades, I've actually been a cancer researcher. So I use tools of engineering to engineer proteins as therapeutics. And in fact, we have a molecule that's in phase three trials for ovarian cancer that we have our fingers crossed is going to continue to do well for patients. And so we've been using the tools of engineering to create new medicines. Our department in bioengineering has really spent two decades doing that, developing new therapeutics and diagnostics, new approaches in synthetic biology to make new materials and, and medicines, as well as protein engineering, which you'll hear a little bit about from Nikita. And we are very excited about going from people health to planet health. The same tools and technologies that we've been using to develop new medicines can actually be used to heal the planet as well in climate and sustainability. And that's what we're super excited about. So we're taking decades worth of experience and now starting to use those tools to apply to climate, agriculture, food. We like to say that the molecules and atoms don't really care what the applications are, and we want to give you a flavor of that today. So I'll turn it over to Nikita, who's going to tell you a little bit about our plastics project. Nikita, take it away. Thank you, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. Fantastic to be here. Uh, super grateful for the chance to share our research with you all today. Um, it's no secret the world has a huge plastics problem. Um, over the last few decades, we've learned how to make all kinds of plastics at mind-blowing rates. And now we have uh, over 350 million tons of plastic uh, born into existence each year. Uh, and I say born into existence because we've done so well in engineering their lifetime, uh, but haven't put nearly as much thought into how to properly manage their end of life. And so it's photos like these that are striking, uh, not only because of the natural beauty uh, that's lost in places like this, but because it illustrates just how long plastic takes to break down and how much of it will continue to flow around in our oceans and land. But it's really hard to imagine modern society without plastics. Uh, nowadays, they're basically in every consumer product and locked away alongside a complex blend of other materials that make up these products. Including plastic and consumer products has made them much less expensive and more accessible for everyone. Um, but this makes recycling these products really challenging because the plastic is mixed in with all kinds of other materials. So our present day recycling facilities are faced with a really difficult task of sorting all of this waste at a rate of something like 200 tons a day, relying on crude separation techniques like shredding and tumbling, like what you're seeing on the left. And while this process might work okay for homogeneous plastics like I, uh, pl uh, bottles and jugs, at the end of the day, uh, all we're left with are tiny plastic bits that have been mechanically and thermally degraded, meaning that the recycled plastic isn't nearly as high performance and thus as valuable as brand new plastic from oil. So ideally we'd have some sort of catalyst that can find the plastic in all this mixed waste, break it down into its molecular building blocks uh, so that we can remake brand new plastic over and over again from waste. And that's where I think biology holds the solution because it is specific and it is tunable. So mushrooms in the forest are able to break down specifically the complex polymers locked away in all that decaying wood and use it as a food source. And bioengineers have been able to take the very same yeast that we use to make bread to turn corn into fuel for our cars on an industrial level. So biology accomplishes both of those things using specialized proteins called enzymes that help catalyze chemical reactions that otherwise won't happen. And so by the same token, we can train biology and its enzymes to go into all of our plastic containing waste, break apart and separate out the plastic component and release the other materials for reuse and recycling. And in our lab, what we've developed is a platform technology that takes enzymes that naturally have some plastic degrading ability and accelerates them to work faster and faster. So our breakthrough R&D engine involves synthetic biology and high throughput screening to rapidly scan for changes that we can make to an enzyme to enable faster breakdown of plastic. Seeing is believing, so I've included a photo here of our second generation enzyme in action, breaking down a model polyester material in mere hours compared to the starting enzyme that took over a week. You can see the blue white material disappear in the bottom right, leaving behind a clear solution. 
We're now looking at how to best apply our tech on an industrial level. And we actually came to the conclusion that society already does a pretty good job recycling things like plastic bottles. By contrast, a mere 1% of textile waste gets recycled back into textiles. And that's where we think we can really leverage biology specificity and tunability to best handle all that multi-material, physically complex textile waste. So what we want to do is enable fiber to fiber, infinite recycling of textiles. We're using our tailored enzymes to break down and separate out the plastic precursors locked away in all that textile waste from which we can remake brand new polyester fiber and at the same time enable the leftover components like cotton to be more easily recycled. This process is very environmentally positive. Our initial estimates include two kilos of CO2 and over 2000 gallons of water saved per kilo textile waste using our process. So we're really excited about the potential our technology has in helping the textiles industry decouple growth from emissions and waste and are actively working to literally engineer it to best meet real world needs. On the one hand, our technology makes it possible to reuse and recycle more textile waste than can be done now, helping leading fashion brands achieve their target waste reduction and circularity goals. And on the other hand, the greater availability of raw materials used in textile manufacturing that we unlock via our process offers textile manufacturers access to higher quality, sustainable supplies of recycled textile materials. And our technology has drop in compatibility with the existing textile supply chain, where we'd be diverting old clothes from landfill on one end and using them as a source of precursor materials on the other instead of natural resources like oil and cotton. And so while we hope that one day biology will rule the world again and everything will be grown and regrown as nature does, we really think that the recycling system of the future will feature multiple advanced technologies where biology plays a key role alongside other advanced recycling technologies that are currently being developed so that we, we can extract as much as possible from all the plastic and textile waste that we're generating today. So once again, thank you so much for the opportunity to share our research with you all here today. We're tremendously grateful to have received support via the Woods Institute, as well as the Stanford School of Sustainability. Um, these have been absolutely critical in allowing us to grow this project direction in the lab and accomplish what we have so far. So on behalf of our team, I just want to emphasize how exciting and meaningful we see programs like these uh, in putting Stanford at the cutting edge of sustainability. So thank you. Thank you so much for the research update. Um, it's also a great, I think, contrast to our work. So I, it's really encouraging to hear about these updates, about you know all the brand new technology that comes out of Stanford and how that will help us um, reach some of our sustainability goals. Um, what I'm presenting today is a slightly different problem and I think a slightly different solution that we need to uh, consider or think about when we talk about um, sustainability. And these are less technical challenges, but more adaptive challenges. So what do I mean by that? Um, my research group actually works on climate extremes and generally disasters. And one of the things that we're noticing again and again is that um, climate extreme and other disasters don't hit the same communities in the same way. Instead, what we have is a very small number of communities taking the biggest hit on some of these challenges. And that sort of leads us to um, try to think about um, the blind spots that we have. So what are the pieces that we're missing? How are we currently thinking about these climate impacts? And are we really prioritizing the need of different communities and what they're experiencing right now, maybe the specific climate impact that they're most affected by? So this is there's no technological solution for this. I'm afraid there's no enzyme that I can create to uh, to sort of serve these communities. Instead, what we're trying to do is we're really partnering with different stakeholders. We're partnering with tribal communities in the Central Valley, who obviously have a long history of, um, of uh, alienation and, and discrimination that they're dealing with on top of some of the climate risks that they're facing. We're also working with governments. We're trying to approach this from multiple angles. And to do that, we have assembled an interdisciplinary team. So um, my name is Jenny, as I said, I work more on the hazard side. I work on the natural processes. Um, our collaborators at the Immigration Policy Lab work on the policy that, uh, how we can improve policy for immigrant communities. The Central Valley is obviously a part of California where immigrants 
really are a key driver of the local economy, a key component of our communities, but not always prioritized in the same way as their output um, would, uh, would require. Also, we work with the law school, the regulatory, uh, the regulation lab, the reg lab for short. And, and what they're really trying to do is modernize how we modernize governance, how modernize how we approach some of these problems. And finally, um, our fourth PI is Gabrielle Wong Parodi. She um, works in psychology and um, risk perception and mitigation. So she does a lot of qualitative work with communities, looking at surveys, trying to understand their needs. And our work is really motivated to try to think about the Central Valley as a proof of concept. The problems facing the Central Valley are no secret. Here you can see some of the recent articles from the popular press about some of the challenges. Um, for example, these include air quality. Um, some of California's poorest workers in the fields face air quality on a daily basis, often ex exacerbated by heat and other challenges. Um, it makes it hard for them to breathe, and it has immediate impacts on their health. Um, on top of that, we have problems, longstanding problems with the quality of drinking water. Um, and also, we might have increasing problems with floods and other issues that are related to climate. So at first, this might seem overwhelming, and it, it, it's not clear like how you could possibly make progress on that. But I do think there are ways to mitigate these problems with a multi-pronged approach that really takes for serious how complex some of these challenges are and starts with how are we currently approaching these and how can we make progress. So more specifically, what we are um, suggesting is um, we have identified a problem, we have these persistent blind spots in how we measure environmental impact for vulnerable communities, but also in community isolation and exclusion. And we need targeted problems to better support these um, so we're investing into self-governance. We're working with tribal communities in the Central Valley that are not necessarily integrated into federal decision making to support them in finding an authentic way in which they can approach these problems. We're also leveraging data innovation. We've bought a huge data set um, from Medicaid that helps us identify all of the medical concerns for individuals in the Central Valley for the last couple of years. And we can identify what kind of communities struggle with what kind of challenges. And then we work with policy evaluation. How, how well are we currently tackling this challenge and where is there room for improvement? So just to add a few more specifics to that, um, for the last part first, currently funding for communities is um, prioritized based on social vulnerability index, which is a very broad index that tries to capture many dimension that could govern vulnerability, like income, like age, et cetera but also doesn't show a lot of detail about what is the specific problem these communities struggle with. So we're updating this index to make it more targeted, to make it more specific to community needs. Second, we're trying to move from um, a regulatory framework that is often mostly focused on carrots, one that uh, mostly focused on sticks to one that embraces carrots, that it embraces the opportunity of providing incentives and positive motivation to improve infrastructure and to improve, for example, water quality, which is a big problem in the, in the Central Valley, partly to mitigate this tendency that sometimes maybe we have a tendency to suppress some problems um, in, in light of regulatory oversight to not be caught for it. So um, we're trying to, re to, to improve and modernize how we tackle these problems. And finally, as I said, we are co-creating environmental governance and co-creating solutions with tribal communities, really in an intent to make sure that we're not repeating some of the problems from the past, where maybe we were, maybe we're, we were too quick to impose our own worldview on other communities. And instead, we really take this very community-centric point of view and co-design the information we're sharing, co-design the approaches with which we, uh, which we tackle these challenges. We hope that this will help improve the situation in the Central Valley, but we also hope that these three aspects, uncovering blind spots and improving regulation, and also making sure that data is shared and accessed by everyone, not just the privileged communities, really translates to some of the other regions that might face similar challenges. With that, I'd like to thank you for being here and, and for your interest in our work. And um, I'm excited to hear some of your questions and suggestions for moving forward.
thanks everyone for those presentations and just sharing a little bit about the work that you're doing um, that's been funded by the accelerator. Um, I'm curious as, as as you listen to each other talk and and you know these are two projects that I think really do provide a good illustration for the audience of how broad the work that we're doing is. But as you listen, do you have any thoughts or reflections on what the new school can achieve? And 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 well, I'll just I'll start there. You know, what what are your hopes and 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 for the new school as we're spinning this up and really beginning on this new journey that is the first in 70 years, as Dean Majindar pointed out. I can chime in first. Um, I, I thought uh, I would start with what keeps me up at night. And, um, you know, I, I think uh, some of the challenges that were already mentioned, uh, especially when Nikita shows his photos of the plastic waste, uh, you know, obviously we have really, grand challenges facing, you know, our um, civilizations uh, in, in order to be able to be more sustainable for future generations. And so um, obviously that that keeps me up at night. Also, um, what what keeps me up and, and Nikita, because he's working late in the lab every night, is um, solutions to these problems, developing new technologies to be able to tackle them. Uh, going back to your question of hope, you know, I, I am very, very hopeful. You've heard about two projects today. Um, you mentioned there are 30 projects that are being funded by the accelerator. Um, we are starting now to tackle these uh, these problems, working together. Uh, I, you heard two examples today of very uh, different types of challenges that we're uh, approaching, one related to policy, one related to, to plastic waste. So I'm, I'm really hopeful that with the, the new school and with the sustainability accelerator in particular, we're, we're going to be able to catalyze uh, real change and, and um, it's already starting to happen. Uh, I'll speak to, to our research. You know, we've, we've already made great progress on proof of concept for enzymes that um, we are hoping to be able to take out into the world and, and really make a difference. And I'm happy to speak more about that, but I want to give my colleagues some airtime here. Yeah, what I'm what I'm really excited about, I think, is really a deliberate focus on tackling problems. I feel like often in science, we just tend to co continue the kind of debates we have, which are great debates, no doubt about it. But um, there, there is not always, I think, a deliberate focus on, hey, there's a huge problem. And why don't we think actively about our role in that, about our role in society and in the role that science can play in contributing to that? So I feel like even that sort of fundamental shift that's sort of a little bit away from the ivory world into something that's a little bit more real, I think is something that I'm very excited about. And I do think there's great potential for science at that interface. I think it's challenging. I think it's going to be hard. But um, I, and I think many people at Stanford like a challenge. So bring it on. I think that's a great point, Jenny. And I also like, uh, as a student and now as a postdoc in, in Jennifer's lab, you know, I've seen um, the Stanford ecosystem from many different angles. And honestly, one of the most exciting things about the uh, sustainability school for me is the idea that we've had so many kind of uh, separate efforts uh, towards these larger sustainability and environmental challenges and solving them. And now this is this sort of unified theory of sustainability that we've kind of built here and beginning to build uh, to sort of work together collaboratively because we all are here at Stanford and we're all trying to solve some of these massive problems that are pretty heavy lifts. Could I, I'd love to hear, I think this is a really great, you know, you're, you're getting at an issue that's 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 really important, which is, you know, the, 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 the fact that we can't do it all here within Stanford. And I'm curious if you could speak about, and obviously they're going to be very different, but speak about how you and your teams collaborate with partners in the, in the outside world. I think that's a really important and distinctive aspect of what the accelerator aims to do. And, and, and you're both, all, or all three of you are great examples of kind of different approaches to doing that. So I'd love to hear uh, maybe perhaps from, from Jenny, from you first, and, and, and then maybe from Nikita and Jennifer, um, just about how you think about working, what's your, what your practical approaches to working with partners? 
Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, so we work with partners a lot. And I think the main takeaway to me or the, the main factor that I think can make partnerships supportive or like successful is really just making them long term. Like this is not just one small project, but we are partners. We're here for you. I think it's often a concern that some of the governments or some of the community groups, when we started working with them, had that, oh, you're an academic, like right now you're interested in us, but what if, like once you get your study, like you're just gonna drop us, right? And I feel like just sort of that respect, that sort of commitment to know we're in this together. We are also part of the community, we're not separate from you. We wanna be there and, and we wanna solve this problem and, and really co-produce it. Like I really generally like want to um, hear their side of the story, hear what they're worried about and try to think about like how can our science elevate that rather than just kind of me imposing my view and, and my sort of research on them right like so think I think it is really the long term of the commitment it is this co-production idea that it's not the scientist who knows what's best but it is the scientist who supports the needs of the partner and I think the needs of the partner tend to be very different we work with small community groups in the Central Valley, we work with governments, we work with federal agencies, we work with the World Bank. And I think they have just very different priorities. They have very different mission statements. And I think what's important is to design science that supports their mission, that supports them of where they're at. And I think that science would be entirely different based on the partnership itself. So the partnership is not an add-on, it's kind of the core of, of what you're doing and why you're doing it. I love that. And just to echo that point, I mean, we're here to make tangible, real world impact. We're not talking about greenwashing. We're not talking about band-aids to the overall problem. We want to actually fix things for the long term, uh, as Jenny is alluding to. And so in our hands, as the engineers with the enzymes, we have the very unique opportunity to literally engineer our you know, enzymes to best meet this problem and, and what the, you know, the fashion brands are looking to, to change with regards to circularity and recycling and actually make that happen. And that doesn't happen overnight. Uh, that's again, a heavy lift. And, and so it's, you know, it takes a, a, a village, right. To, to make this happen. And just chiming in on that, um, we are also starting to look at other industries in particular people have seen the article that came out on the accelerator programs and have reached out to us about tackling medical waste, for example. That's something we would really be interested in. Obviously, you know, medical waste, uh, single-use plastic have, has been transformative for the medical community, but it's, it's exacerbated this, this issue. And, uh, you know, so even, even while being on this uh, Zoom meeting, I've actually already gotten several emails from people who've been on the, the uh, participant list who are interested in getting involved. So we're very excited in, in having people partner with us to be able to help us scale our efforts. As Nikita mentioned, it does take a village. And while the Sustainability Accelerator uh, funding has been catalytic and transformative for us, obviously we can go further and go farther if we have partnerships and additional support for our work. Thanks for all those thoughts. Let me ask you one final question, and maybe maybe we can start with with Jennifer this time. Um, scale is a huge priority for our school. Dean Majundar mentioned it. How do you think about scale up for you know you're starting with the you know literally the microscopic right and 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 but have enormous ambition to affect global supply chains and really build circular economies around plastics that don't exist right now. H how do you think about achieving that? And, and, and what's the role of, of the, the university and the accelerator in, in helping to support that? What should the I think role it's be? A really, yeah, yes, no, I think it's a really important question because we can do something in the laboratory, but of course, if we can't scale it, the world isn't going to be able to benefit from it. It ends up in a nice journal article and, and you know, maybe we get an award for it or something. But, um, you know, as Nikita mentioned, like we're really here because we want to make an impact and the way to do that is to, to scale. And um, so there's a lot of different ways that, that scaling comes into play. And one thing that's top of mind for us is, let's say, you know, we get an enzyme that has the properties that we've been discussing we need to make enough of it so that we can actually, you know, have an impact on the the, the textiles that we're we're looking to um, to impact. And so, um, 
this is where this is where the conversations and partnerships are really important because we need to be able to manufacture this at an industrial scale. We need resources to be able to do that. And um, uh, you know, we we've been having a lot of conversations around that. And Nikita can chime in, but you know, he took a course at Stanford, the Climate Ventures course, where he got to talk to 50 different groups and, and organizations and people about these very questions, about the needs, about the what are the critical things that considerations that one needs to be thinking about. So I can I can let Nikita chime in about that. But but as you know, Michael, from the meetings we've been having with the accelerator team, we are thinking about these things at the very early stages. We're not doing this in a linear manner till we get results and then we're going to start thinking about it. We've been thinking about it in lockstep at the beginning of the project. So Nikita, I don't know if you want to comment because you've been putting a lot of effort into the scaling. Yeah, I think from the get-go, I mean, I, I want to shout out to the business school and um, the Stanford Climate Ventures uh, teaching team. Uh, they've been absolutely uh, instrumental in helping us sort of validate the real world use case for this technology. And so from the onset, um, we really believed in engineering a solution that would actually work in the in the real world. And so we connected with something like 50 to 100 uh, folks uh, out in, both in the plastics recycling space and the textile industry to understand uh, not only what their needs are presently, uh, but largely to understand how this technology could make a difference in their hands. And again, we have this unique position where we're able to you know, tailor that technology to, uh, to, to be most compatible and therefore most impactful um, in their hands. Yeah, I, ha I have to admit that I, I think for us, the question of scale, I think, is quite a different one than it is for a technological innovation. Um, and I think it's something that I have to admit I feel ambivalent about. I feel like on the one hand side, yes, we do need it. And we work with disadvantaged communities worldwide. And honestly, it's heartbreaking. And it's not getting better, quite to the contrary. It's getting worse, right? And I feel like the blind spot issue is a big dynamics there that we just don't like to look right and it's uncomfortable and and it's tough these are like hard you know like it's it's not even like easy to forge a good relationship with the community because they've been disappointed so many times and we've heard often heard like oh stanford again right like you need new lab rats and i'm like oh no that's really not how we're thinking about this so so i think there's definitely some challenge there but on the other hand i also think we need to, I think the opportunity I see in terms of scale is just prioritizing the problem, prioritizing the voices, trying to elevate their voices. I'm not trying to impose my voice on theirs, but maybe we can support their, their voice and maybe their voice will inspire other voices. I think it's important when we, one thing I've learned with the communities that we partner with is they have very individual needs. They have very individual worries. I can't have one answer for a tribal community in the Central Valley and expect that that's gonna be the same, even in Alaska. Right. Like it's 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 just very different. And I think that individualism and I think that cultural authenticity is really key to whatever solution we want to suggest or like to whatever solution we want to consider. And I think I think we can get better at this. I think the scale opportunity here is one of learning on the research side. Like, how do we learn to do this research? How do we learn to do these partnerships? Are there best practices to be shared? Are there tools to be shared? Right. Like maybe the communities can share their suggestions or their answers. Right. Like how they approach self-governance, how they approach building their own purple air sensors and like distributing them and measuring them. Right. Like So I feel like the what worries me about the scale argument is it can't be the same answer for everyone. And I think it can't be a one size fits all solution. And I think bad things will happen if we pretend that. Um, I think good things will happen if we really take a modest point of view and use our resources, but also our analytical capacities to elevate what the communities need, what they say, and how they want to approach these problems. So it's more of an empowering dynamics where I see the opportunity of scale rather than one where it's on me to, to sort of scale up one particular approach. So we're going to pivot to taking questions from the audience. And I'm going to try to curate this a little bit because we have a lot of questions. And so I apologize to audience members that we don't get to. Um, we've had some questions and I'm going to try to sort of spot themes and, and, and focus on some themes. We've had some questions about... Um, how the 
other parts of the university, in particular the GSB, are involved in the accelerator. And I, I think, Nikita, you would be well poised to talk to that. And I wonder if you could just talk about your experiences and your knowledge about kind of how other elements of the university that are entrepreneurial in approach are interacting with the work that you're doing. Yeah, happy to. Um, I've been a huge proponent of increasing the diffusion coefficient between, you know, sort of the engineering sciences over here on this side of the campus and sort of the business school, as well as the humanities on other parts of the campus here. So we work together towards, you know, developing a solution for some of these big problems. And, uh, you know, I mentioned the Stanford Climate Ventures Program. I was also uh, lucky to be uh, an Excel Innovation Scholar during my PhD. Uh, that was through the Stanford Technology Ventures Program. And so those were, you know, very transformative um, experiences that allowed me to sort of peer beyond the, the lab, right, and really think about how to, you know, design the experiments that I'm doing in the lab uh, to most realistically, um, you know, reflect what's out there in the real world, whether it be sort of in, at scale in some of these larger uh, industrial uh, manufacturing sites, or, you know, one thing that I, I you know, a theme that I heard in, in sort of Jenny's uh, response just now was very much this idea of tailoring to, to specific, um, you know, groups of people's uh, needs and also uh, geographical needs, right? So, you know, the world is a very diverse and, and, and a very, uh, you know, there's many different uh, situations across, across the world, geographically speaking. And so, you know, that has also been a really valuable experience in, in sort of having, uh, sort of going outside of the, you know, the Bay Area that, that can be sometimes feel a little bit like a bubble and connect with some folks. I mean, we've connected with folks, uh, you know, in, in Uganda talking about, you know, how they have plastic bottles flowing down um, the sides of the of, of the streets because they have no, you know, waste management, no recycling management. And so we're very optimistic about the idea of using our technology in sort of a decentralized way where it's, you know, low resource, all we need is water, salt, and enzyme to basically set up, uh, you know, some, some, uh, some preliminary waste management solutions as we work towards, you know, really helping address some of the big challenges that they're facing in, in parts of the world like there. Um, Jenny, could you give us kind of a, a, a sense, a, a number of people in the audience are really impressed with the work on environmental justice and just want to have a more concrete flavor, for like a, almost like a case study for, you know, one example of one of the engagements that you're talking about. Could you just tell us a little bit more about what, 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 what one of these very context specific engagements where you bring Stanford resources to bear on a problem, what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for asking that. I'm, I'm all about specifics. And so, so I very much appreciate the follow-up. Um, so for example, um, one of the things you're noticing, and I think it goes to this blind spot idea, is like when you look at purple air data, right? Like here in the Bay Area, it's abundant and you see tons of it. But in some of the tribal lands in the Central Valley, there isn't a single sensor. And, and these are some of the communities that are the most affected. So one of the things we are doing is working with a tribal council and trying to identify what is their interest? Like, can we make sensors available? And if we make these available, like how would they, the, how would they like to manage the data? Like who has access to that data? Do they want it to be integrated into the bigger network or maybe not, right? Or how do they, how do they wanna pass on that information? So I think that is one aspect of it, but also we are accompanying, accompanying that sort of build out of a monitoring network, which is more individualized. Like I think we're moving towards this more individualized monitoring, which is in many ways great because it gives you a much more refined, nuanced look. But we just have to be really careful that we're not emitting entire community groups from that, from that approach, which is what's happening right now. So, so we are making, we're building this network together with the community and also identifying, you know, um, their values and how they want to approach, how they want to share that information and what they want to do with that information. And um, through surveys, identifying what kind of other information do they need or how would they feel better supported through specific programs. So the surveys to me, what we're trying to do in our project is really blend the quantitative and the qualitative. I myself am an applied mathematician, so I naturally gravitate towards the numbers and, and sort of we, we try to fill sort of these, these sort of 
areas where we don't have information. But I think it's really exciting to me to have this complementary view that Gabrielle Wong Parodi and her group does about the surveys and how people perceive risk and how the communities deal with risk and to which degree they approach it as a community or as an individual. And I think how we what, what's interesting to me as someone who studies natural disasters is a disaster is never natural. It's really a terrible term, right? Like a disaster is a human disaster. It, de it depends on how we respond, how our behavior, right? Like people don't die from the earth shaking, they die from being trapped in buildings or being buried by bridges or making wrong decisions and being run over in, in traffic. So it's really a lot about how humans or how communities perceive risk, how they act on it. And I think we need solutions that is that are authentic to their values and, and their culture. And I think we need sort of that degree of subtlety and the surveys that we're doing, I think, really help identify that. Thank you. That was wonderful. I I just thought about your your reference to Sizer. I think it was two days ago was the 35th anniversary of Loma yeah. Prieta. I remember that vividly growing up. Um, Jennifer, we've been getting a lot of questions in the in the in the Q and A about sort of thinking about the plastics ecosystem, and I'm curious how you think about the role of the sort of circular economy technologies that you're developing relative to kind of re reduction in the use of plastic. And there's there's definitely a theme in some of the questions, like, shouldn't we be reducing our plastic usage? Um, and I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. For sure. And and we are approaching this as we should as a yes and situation. I, I think there are many different, you know, points of attack and facets that we should all be be using to uh, tackle this this question and problem. Um, but, but we're also being realistic, right? I mean, plastics are here. Um, they're being used. So there are a number of different things. Obviously, reducing plastic is is a, is an important thing to do. And, and you know, there are headroads being made into that with um, water bottles. You know, people are now starting to fill them up. You go to the airport, you see signage telling you, you know, how, how many water bottles you're saving by bringing your re reusable bottle. So there are things uh, of that nature. With clothing, I don't even think many people are aware that the majority of clothing that we use is not recyclable. And when you bring it to Goodwill, you think you're doing something great or a thrift store, but it's actually, you know, most of it's thrown out or being incinerated. And Nikita can can speak to that because he's he's done a lot of research on that. So, and same thing with medical waste, you know, I mean, um, unless we invent new solutions for new inputs for these things, we're, we're going to be faced with, with the output. And where we started the conversation was how the plastics industry has designed plastics to be really long life. They, they for the most part, don't break down. However, there are products coming on the market now that, that are um, compostable and, and do have a shorter lifetime. Some of our material science and chemical engineering colleagues have been joining our conversation about how do we partner together to develop new plastics that could better feed into the recycling and upcycling light lifespan and, and workflow. And so that's uh, stay tuned on that. That we're hoping to make some inroads on that as well. And um, another project we didn't get a chance to talk about today was um, we are tackling um, the palm oil issue where we are able to take waste and hopefully turn it into palm oil. So we have a lot of different things that we're working on from the technology solution side, but I think we all need to be part of this solution and this this um, this problem. Um, going back to it takes a village, uh, um, I, I think that can't be stressed enough. Like we all have a responsibility for this. Well, thank you all for taking the time to speak with us today and to share what you're doing, your work, and answer questions about it. I'm going to turn uh, the the meeting over to uh, our partner, uh, Georgia Farouk, who's going to close us out. Thank you, Michael, and thank you to the incredible researchers. I think I can speak for the audience when I say we just loved hearing about your work. Again, my name is Georgia Farouk, and I'm so pleased to be with you all to provide some closing reflections. So as the executive director of Thrive, which is the Alliance of Nonprofits for all of San Mateo County, for those of you not here in the Bay Area, that's uh, right next door to where Stanford is, I wanna share how thrilled we are and our community is that Stanford has taken this super bold step of dedicating a new school to address planetary challenges. 
We, along with so many I know of you in the audience, celebrate the launch of the Door School of Sustainability. Thanks to the speakers uh, we just heard for the exciting inspirational work you're doing to move this vision forward. It resonated with so much of what I think the Thrive team has been doing. I think about uh, Doug Silverstein, I have to shout out to him. He was the founder of our kind of environment and sustainability practice. And a few years back, uh, you know, gathered a bunch of stakeholders in San Mateo County to quote, rethink uh, single use plastics, reduce and rethink single use plastics. So I think he would be in particular, he's in Germany now, uh, but I think he'd be really thrilled to hear about the research that's happening. And, uh, you know, Jennifer, uh, the, the work you're leading there is incredible with Nikita and Jenny, uh, so much of what you do and actually some of the researchers on your team, we've had the chance to intersect with and we'll be referencing that. Uh, so much of what you're doing in Central Valley is, um, I think, being applied here hyper locally as well. And we appreciate that. So I, for once, feel a sense of uh, great momentum and maybe even optimism given your leadership. And uh, as the mom of a three year old right here in Redwood City, I'm personally really grateful for your activism. So at Thrive, you may kind of guess already, we're sort of nonprofit cheerleaders to some extent. Uh, we unite the voice of our local nonprofit sector because we firmly believe that this voice can serve as a community's true north. We also have an unwavering belief in the value of the work that nonprofits do on the ground and in our communities. Um, at Thrive, we focus on a range of issues. Many of you may work on those issues, children and education, uh, immigrant and workers' rights, and really the, the theme of today, environment sustainability. So in this latter area, most recently, Stanford has been an incredible partner and advocate of local community voice. Yes, occasionally Stanford uh, gets, uh, there are, you know, as I think uh, uh, Jenny referred, there, there's skepticism at times, but what we've seen these last, uh, this, you know, in our recent work has really been uh, one where Stanford has been working hard to center community voice. So we've talked about this already, but I have to reiterate that while there's no question that climate change is impacting us on a global scale, we sometimes forget the very tangible impacts already felt by our next door neighbors. Poor air quality leading to asthma and a very neighborhood specific, um, livelihoods being disrupted by flooding and even increased home repair expenses due to environmental damages burdening already financially insecure households. And we know that adaptation is past due and essential for these communities, given our county's high exposure to wildfire, extreme heat, sea level rise, river-based flooding, landslide, and drought. So to shed light on the growing inequities for the frontline communities right here in our region, Thrive um, Alliance, we co-hosted our first annual climate summit for San Mateo County with our local nonprofit partners climate resilient communities, Western Casa and Rise South City. If you don't know these nonprofits and their fierce leaders, you should take the time to get to know them. You would be in awe of their commitment, care and collective action toward building resilience in their local neighborhoods. This summit did not happen in a vacuum. This is really important to note. It was enabled by broad institutional support, which we know is a critical component to elevating these urgent calls to action. To that end, the Climate Summit was generously co-presented by Stanford University with additional support from the Haas Center for Public Service and the Stanford Door School of Sustainability, along with lead sponsors, Silicon Valley Community Foundation and Peninsula Clean Energy. So it took months of meticulous planning alongside Stanford's Office of Community Engagement. While Stanford certainly plays on a global stage, through this partnership, we saw their commitment to local residents in action. One thing that stood out, in addition to the beautiful sun-filled space that we convened in courtesy of Stanford's Redwood City campus, is that Stanford researchers have been increasingly leading from behind, recognizing that addressing community need as identified by community members must come first. We heard from one of Jenny's uh, uh, researchers, uh, research partners, Derek Oyang, designer, engineer, and educator, and research manager at Stanford's Regulation, Evaluation, and Governance Lab, who has flipped the typical research model. He first focuses on facilitating uh, positive community outcomes, and then the white paper comes later. As Derek noted, climate change doesn't allow us 
time for protracted research with no action. The best part of Derek's research is that the community partners have led both design and implementation efforts. Partners like Violet Sienna, founder and executive director of CRC, have led the way. What does this look like in practice? Through this partnership, funding became more targeted to specific communities and the research focused on not just sea level rise, but the community's most immediate concerns. For example, extreme heat and the lack of tree canopies in certain frontline communities and rolling out even small scale solutions became a priority. So these conversations and more were enabled at this summit and we know that the day will spur more incredible partnerships with Stanford in years to come. I'd like to invite you all to think about the Stanford community as Thrive does, as a collaborative partner with compassionate leadership. Interested in realizing your idea, ideas for collective action and having the talent and resources to mobilize for a greater good. Yes, Stanford is a place to attend a concert or enjoy a football game, as I recently did with my family, but this moment calls for something more. Stanford and universities across our country are centers of lifelong learning and in that spirit, they are spaces that can serve as connecting points to generating community-based solutions that can provide a path forward for our collective futures. Finally, I want to thank each of you for participating in Discover Sanford for You. Please let us know your thoughts on today's event. When you get the survey, reach out to Stanford University through community.stanford.edu. There you can also subscribe to the monthly email newsletter, Stanford for You. We look forward to connecting further as well as, as, as we all work towards a better future. Thank you so much.